I'm really excited about the Life Group program that we have. We're going to have, um, I think, five or maybe six different classes offered this fall. So we want you to check out the whole spread. There's different topical ones. There's a finance one. There's a men's group, a women's group. There's all kinds of groups coming. And so those signups go up next week. This is taking that next step, Christ, community, and commission. All right. I've talked plenty about that now. Um, now, I do want to say a quick word about the offering. We are not a church that passes plates. Uh, we used to maybe before the pandemic, but we have the bucket out in the back. And as you can see, you can give in the lobby or you can text uh, any amount to that phone number or you can give online at SynergyR.com. But even though we don't pass the plates, I still want to recognize this moment. And we want to pray and dedicate these gifts to God. So please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, you have given us everything. And we are so grateful. Lord, every breath in our lungs, every penny in our bank accounts comes from you. And out of all that abundance, we have given this portion back. And so God, I just ask that the gifts that were given today, that you would bless them, bless the people who have given, pour out your abundance in our life, provide for your church, provide for your people. And God, we dedicate these gifts. We ask that you would use this money, this financial gift, that it would be used for Center Church to be a beacon of love in our community. The Byron Center would know Jesus better because of the things that we do. We love you so much. In your name, amen. Our teaching text comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 44. And it says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If, everyone, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone f uh, forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward? Oh, I'm, I read way past. <laughs> God's word is so good. I, let me finish. I'm going to keep reading. If you love those who love you, what reward do you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Please pray with me. Dear Jesus, I ask that you come into this place and help me to preach. If I've written down anything that is your word, anything that is good for their heart to grow and know you, then God, I just ask that you would open our hearts, open our ears to receive your words. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may that be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Back when I was in college, I lived uh, my first two years in the dormitories. I went to Calvin College, which is up in Grand Rapids. And it was a fantastic school. I met my wife there. I got a great education. I had a really fun time. But the way that the dormitories are set up, up at Calvin College, is that there's a male wing and a female wing to every dorm. And then they have this middle part, the lobby. And so I lived in a dorm called Bolt Heinz Timmer, BHT. And I was in the male dorm, Bolt. And during that time, I got into a little bit of a prank war with some ladies on the other side of the dorm. And now, I'm going to date myself just a little bit, but when I was in college, there was a TV show that was just coming out called The Office. And in that TV, you know it, we've heard of this. Now, in that TV show, one of the best parts of the show was the prank war between two of the main characters, Dwight and Jim, right? They would prank each other. And so, <laughs> Dwight was really obnoxious, and Jim would pull these like amazing, elaborate pranks. And in the very first episode, Jim takes Dwight's stapler and submerges it in jello. You remember this, right? And he's like, "Ah, oh, my stapler's in jello." He gets so mad about it. And so, inspired by that television show, we got into a bit of a prank war. And I want to be very clear: they started it. <laughs> Uh, my sophomore year, I got a, a job at the coffee shop on campus, and I was working in the coffee shop on campus, and one day during my shift, I was standing there innocent as a dove, the very picture of hardworking holiness. <laughs> and my friends delivered to me a massive plate of jello. 
And inside the jello were my flip-flops. They took my shoes and they put them in jello. It was like a brownie pan of jello with flip-flops in it. So to get back at them, I did a prank called cupping. Does anyone know what cupping is? You are good people. I'm so proud of you for not knowing. Uh, <laughs> cupping is where you take dozens of plastic cups and you staple them together in a shape, maybe a symbol or a letter, and you, you spell it out. And then you put them in somewhere inconvenient, and then you fill all the cups with water. Because it's really annoying, because once they're full of water, you can't lift them up. And you can't separate them, because the staples will rip holes so the water gets everywhere. So I stapled together two big old J's, and I put them right in the middle of their dorm room floor. <laughs> um, and the, pr the prank war had begun. And the pranks continued all semester, always back and forth. At one point, they toilet papered my bed. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of toilet papering, right? Normally you take toilet paper, throw it around someone's yard. I didn't have a yard, but I had a bed, and they toilet papered it. And it was terrible, because I got back late that night, and I wanted to just roll into bed, and there was toilet paper everywhere. It was awful. So to get back at them, I do want to pause and make sure none of the teenagers are taking notes. <laughs> but to get back at them, I did something called, uh, let's see. Yeah, my bed was mummified by toilet paper. And then <laughs> some of the pranks were simple, like leaning a trash can up against their door, right, filled partway with water. So when they open it, the water just splashes down all over their feet. Or sometimes we would toothpick one another. You ever heard of this? Where you scatter toothpicks all over someone's room. It's awful because you can't vacuum up toothpicks, right? You got to pick them up by hand. It's super annoying. <sighs> Toothpicking is where you scatter all of those things. Now, one time we actually filled up someone's room with balloons for their birthday, and then we stretched saran wrap across the door so they like walked right into it. It was hilarious. Now, other pranks became more complex, more elaborate. For example, at the peak of the war, I went all out. I knew that my friends were going to go see a movie. They were going to be gone all night. So I recruited a bunch of friends, and we raided their bed. We disassembled their room and then reassembled it back on the roof. We took apart the beds and their desks and their computers and everything. Then we went up onto the roof and reassembled it all and put it all back with extension cables. It was powered. They could have stayed up there. <laughs> One of my favorite ones is we filled, it was in February uh, when we did that, and uh, we filled their shower with snow, just packed the shower floor to ceiling with snow. Now, I love a good prank. It's a lot of fun. And that, but there was always a set of rules. We want pranks to be annoying, but not destructive, right? We never wanted to hurt anyone or break anything. That was, you know, it was meant to be good-natured fun. Somebody pranks you, and so you prank them back with an equal or greater prank, right? Cause and effect. But here's the thing. Prank wars are exhausting. They're so, when, it, like, it got to a point, they're so, it's fun to pull off a prank, but then you live the rest of your life in fear terrified of when the next terrible thing is going to happen to you. And after months of back and forth, back and forth, you're just burned out. It stops being fun and you just want it to stop, but you can't figure out how. It's like this vicious cycle. And eventually you realize that the only way to stop a prank war is to just stop. The only way to stop is to stop. In the church, we call that forgiveness. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We all know the old phrase, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Well, I'm pretty sure they were talking about Samson. And so if you want to grab your Bible, we're going to jump into Judges chapter 13. Now, I know when you think of judges in the modern world, we think about like an old guy in a robe with a fake hair, like the wig or whatever, and a gavel. But in ancient Israel, the word judge was more about a warrior, hero, temporary ruler. After Israel was freed from slavery in Egypt, you remember that story, right? When they were slaves in Egypt, after they got freed, but before they got to the kings, like King David in them, they had this group called the judges. And there were 12 judges of Israel. And it, it was a really confusing time for the people. There was lots of fighting, but there were times when they needed a hero. They needed a judge to step forward and save them. And so Samson was the 12th and final judge for Israel. Because after Samson, it was so bad, Israel realized they needed a king. Now, I think a lot of people know pieces of the story of Samson. 
And the story of Samson is always told with him being the hero. But today, I want to tell you a very different story. Um, our story starts with an action scene. In chapter 13, there's this part where he's walking and a lion jumps out of the vineyard where Sam Samson's walking. He's walking through a vineyard. There's grapes everywhere. And a lion jumps out. And Samson tears the lion apart with his bare hands. Now, I, I should back up a little bit so we know why that just happened. Samson is blessed with this like crazy superhuman strength as long as he follows a set of rules that his parents were given. There were certain foods that were forbidden to his mom. They could never cut his hair, and there were certain things he couldn't drink. And if you cut his hair, he would lose his strength. It's kind of like if Hercules and Rapunzel had a baby. That's Samson, right? <laughs> so that's how Samson tears a lion apart with his bare hands, and he does this, and he continues on his way. He's just like, all right, I killed the lion. And then he just walks away as if that's not the craziest thing that ever happened to him. But then a few days later, he sees the body of the lion that he killed. He was walking in that same area and he hears a buzzing sound and he looks inside the lion, the lion carcass. There's a, there's a beehive and there's like a honeycomb developing inside this lion. And so the bees are using the carcass to build a home. So Samson scrapes out some of the honey to eat it. And he walks away eating honey because, you know, yum. <laughs> Fast forward a little bit. And Samson is at his wedding feast. He's getting married. And, and he makes a wager with some of the people who are there. He says, okay, if you can solve this riddle... I will give you 30 sets of clothing. But if you can't solve the riddle, you have to give me 30 sets of clothing. Apparently, Samson needed some new threads and wardrobes are expensive. So he's going to make a little wager. And then he tells them this <coughs> riddle about the lion. This is in chapter 14, verse 14. And it says, tell us your riddle. They said, let's hear it. He replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, came something sweet. And for three days, they could not give the answer. Now, of course, they have no idea what the answer to the riddle is, right? That's insane. How could they ever guess? But then they go to Samson's wife and they, they get her to find out the real answer. And Samson tells her, she tells them, and then they win the wager. And Samson is furious. And so in response, he's like, this isn't fair. It wasn't fair for them to cheat at the riddle. So to get back at them, he goes to a nearby village and kills 30 men from the town, takes their clothes and says, here, I settled the wager, right? And then he was still really angry. He killed these guys and then he's so mad. So he goes back to his father's house and he ignores his new bride. He's, I'm not even going to go home. I'm just going to go to my dad's house. Now, I think it's fair to pause at this moment and say that is an overreaction, <laughs> right? That's insane. That's crazy. Yikes on bikes. Okay, so now Samson's bride, her father, thought that Samson had abandoned her because she didn't come home. And so the father, he's like, oh, no, my daughter, her husband didn't come home. He's abandoned her. So he gives her to Samson's best man. He gives her to another man in marriage. And Samson comes back later and he finds out his wife has been given to his best man and he's furious all over again. So what he does is he goes out into a field. He catches 300 foxes, ties torches to the tails of the foxes, and then sets them free through the fields of the Philistines. The, the foxes go running through the fields and burn down all the grain and all the vineyards and all the olive groves. I imagine the devastation was huge. So the Philistines are furious. And when they find out why Samson has burned down their fields, right? That others, had, that the daughter had been given to someone else. They take the father and the daughter, and then they, they take them and burn them at the stake. And in chapter 15, verse seven, it says, chapter 15, verse seven, it says, Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. And then he attacked them viciously and slaughtered many of them. So Samson kills a whole bunch of Philistines to get his revenge. So to recap real quick, kills a lion. There's some honey has a little wager, kills 30 men, gives his wife away, burns down all their fields with foxes, burns his wife and father-in-law, then kills thousands of people. Then, in response to that killing, the Philistines make a raid on a city called Lehi. Samson wasn't even in Lehi. 
but they just raid the city and kill a bunch of people. So the men of Lehi are so mad at Samson. So they go up, they, they're like, we're going to take Samson out. So they tie him up, but he just stands up and he breaks the bonds and he kills a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. Does any of this seem insane to anybody else? <laughs> This is crazy. This isn't just eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. This is revenge on top of revenge on top of revenge. And it has escalated until there are thousands of people dying. And it all started with one riddle. Now, quick show of hands. How many of you knew this part of the story? And many, some of you have read it. Okay, some of you have read it. This is crazy. This is, I, this is not the version I knew when I was a little kid, right? I knew parts of it, but man. So time goes on. And Samson falls in love with a woman named Delilah. They wrote a song about her. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this part of the story will probably seem a little more familiar. We're up to chapter 16, if you're following along in your Bible. Now, three times she asks him the secret of his power. And eventually he tells her about his hair. And that night she cuts his hair and he loses his strength. And the Philistines, they capture Samson, they gouge out his eyes, and then they throw a party like this big celebration. They chain Samson up between these two pillars and they throw this big party to mock him. And if you know Samson, if you know the story at all, this is probably the part you know, right? Where he's chained up between these two pillars and he prays to God one more time. He says, God, give me my strength one more time. And God restores his strength for one final push and he pushes out the pillars and the entire building collapses, killing thousands and himself. And that is the story of Samson. And what's crazy to me is sometimes people insist on painting Samson as a hero. And when they say that, I'm like, did you read the same story I did? I mean, Samson is supposed to be the good guy. I mean, I'm not trying to ruin the story for anyone, but this is so violent and horrible. Why on earth did I pick this to talk about on a holiday weekend? But let's be honest. There are parts of this story that are understandable to our hearts cause and effect. It's very natural for humans to want revenge. It's literally written into the foundational laws of our country. We say in our constitution, let the punishment be equal to the crime. You poke my eye out, I get to poke your eye out. It's only fair. It's logical. Revenge makes sense to our hearts. One of the guiding principles of the universe in physics is that for every action, there should be an equal and opposite reaction. It all makes sense to us. Logically, revenge is about getting even, about being fair. And yet, when I read this story, where people are being burned at the stake in revenge for the fact that he burned down their crops. All I see is a pile of ashes. He killed them, so they killed some other people, so then he kills more people and there's more. And then I just, where does it end? An eye for an eye truly does make the whole world blind. And look, I'm not here this morning to shock you with the graphic details of the Old Testament. I think a lot of us, we already know the Old Testament is very graphic. The Old Testament is full of brutal stories that come from a brutal time in history. We know this, but I am here to remind you today that there is a better way. I'm here to remind you that Jesus, the Son of God and the Savior of the world, gives us a better way. The upside-down kingdom of Jesus, of God, has something better to offer than the endless cycle of revenge that the world offers, something better than the way of the world. I say it all the time, and I'm going to keep saying it. One of my favorite things, one of my favorite questions that I ask anytime I spend time in the Word of God is I ask the question, what does this passage teach me about the character of God? What do I learn about the God that is out there? And the second question I ask is, how do I change my life as someone who worships that God? And if you read your Bible and you ask those two questions over and over, you will grow in your faith. And Samson shows us a lot about who God is. So first we see that God can use broken things for his purposes. God worked through Samson, who I think we can all agree was a terrible person. God worked through Samson to eventually bring Israel into the promised land. God triumphed over the Philistines and he started it with Samson. He specializes, our God specializes in taking sin and turning it into glory. Taking something that is broken and making it stronger than it ever was. This works in our lives too. God can take the broken mess of your life and do something amazing with it. 
And if God can use Samson, that hot mess of a terrible person, then he can use you too. One of the greatest and most reassuring things that I have ever heard in my life was when somebody told me as a pastor, when God put the calling on your life, when God reached out to you with his love and his calling and said, I want to send you into the world, he already factored in your stupidity. Makes me feel better. (laughs) God knows all your limitations. He knows all your brokenness. He knows you as you truly are. And he still loves you. He still calls you. He still reaches out to you. You, as the people of God, you are God's primary method of transforming the world. Sometimes people wonder, well, how come God doesn't come out of the skies and just fix stuff? And he's like, because it's you. You are the ones. You are his primary method of transforming the world. If you are in this room today or watching with us online, God has placed a calling on your life. And you might think, to yourself, well, I'm just waiting for a sign. I'm just waiting for for some sort of signal that God wants to use me in the world. And I've got good news for you. It's right here. It's coming out of my mouth right now. If God can work with Samson, just imagine what he can do with your life. Imagine how many people he can help love through your hands and your feet. I've heard some messed up stories in my time as a pastor. Church is full of all kinds of broken people. But unless you're out there killing thousands of people with the jawbone of a donkey, you're not worse than Samson. And God can work with him so he can work amazing things in your life too. God uses broken things for his purposes, and that includes you. The second thing I see in this story about the character of God is that no matter how much we screw up, God will always forgive you when you come home. When you repent God is waiting with open arms. Samson broke every single vow. He drank the stuff he wasn't supposed to drink. He ate the stuff he wasn't supposed to eat. He had no regard for the Nazarene code of ethics, and he even cut his hair. Every promise that he made to God, he broke. He did not deserve forgiveness. But when he repented, God was there in your life. Maybe you're not ripping lions apart or killing people to settle wedding wagers. But we all have sin in our lives, don't we? Romans tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And just like Samson, we don't don't deserve forgiveness. But when you repent, if you give your life to Jesus, he offers you a new life. You have heard it said that the wages of sin is death and that the problems of your life are too much. But I say to you that Jesus, Jesus says to you, you are forgiven. You are washed clean because Jesus has paid the price. Repentance leads to forgiveness. And forgiveness is from God. I mean, the very idea, the concept of forgiveness is unnatural. The eye for an eye mentality is designed to be this cycle of pain and misery. He killed them because they killed those guys, because he burned this field, because they stole that, because she said that. And it goes on and on. The cycle of revenge that this world offers turns into a chain of blame going all the way back to something you don't even remember. And that chain of blame turns into shackles. It's worse than any prison. But the forgiveness of God offered in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is designed to break the chains. God has given us a way out, a way to stop the cycle of pain and misery that the revenge forces on us, repentance and forgiveness. It's that moment where we can see a glimpse of freedom. Earlier, I said that revenge is a natural desire. It makes so much sense for us to want revenge, cause and effect. In every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But just because something is natural does not mean that it is good. Just because something is understandable for us to want revenge does not mean that it is holy. God shows us a better way. Matthew 5, we heard it earlier, verse 38, he says, You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If everyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those 
who persecute you. A couple of years ago, I had, I had a group of eighth graders in a confirmation class. They were getting ready to join the church. I was in a different tradition. They had a different class. But I asked them, I said, why should you forgive your enemies? They were completely baffled by the question, why should we forgive our enemies? And they were baffled. They said, I don't know, because the Bible says so. And I was like, no, 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 that's not good enough. Because if you don't understand why you're supposed to do something, you won't do it. If you don't know why, then you're not going to do it. And so the reason that we love our enemies, the reason we forgive people who hurt us is to stop the cycle of pain. Jesus came to teach us this love, forgiveness. These are not logical things. They don't make sense. They completely defy reason and they are God's secret to a holy life. And so I have two challenges for you today. Number one, if you don't know Jesus, if you're still living in the endless cycle of cause and effect, action, reaction, revenge on revenge, that cycle that turns into a chain of events that becomes shackles for us, if you are living as a slave to that cycle, I want you to break free. I want you to, you can't earn salvation. There's nothing you can do to fix your life, but through repentance, you can have forgiveness from Jesus and break free from the shackles. With Jesus, you can stop the cycle of revenge and walk away from the methods of the world and enter into something better. So that's my first challenge for you today. I want you to break free of the cycle through forgiveness. I want you to step into something better. My second challenge, I want you to take a moment right now. I want you to think of someone in your life who has hurt you, someone who needs your forgiveness. And they didn't ask for it. They don't deserve it, but they need your forgiveness. You can't go through life without being hurt. It's not possible. The world is full of people who can hurt you. Maybe they lied, maybe they cheated, and you've got that pain inside, that pain, that desire to get even, that urge to get revenge. That is poison in your system. That's what ruined Samson's life. But God, through the example of Jesus Christ, he shows us a better way. And so I want you to let it go. I want you to forgive I want you to break those chains. Let that toxin out of your life. I want you to start, pr and, and if you can't forgive right now, I want you to start praying for help, that God would help you forgive. Because sometimes forgiveness is a long process, and we all need all the help that we can get. I remember I was leading the camp one time, and, and it was on the very first day, it was Sunday night, the kids showed up for camp. I was the dean of a camp. I was co-deans with a friend. And as we were up there, on the very first day, I gave a devotion about forgiveness. And I said, we need to forgive. And I had a, a student, a young high school girl. She got up, she just walked out in the middle of my lesson. <laughs> and I was a little baffled. I was like, oh, what just happened? But another counselor went with her and it was fine. So I stayed and I finished up the lesson with the kids. And she came to me later that week. It was the last night. We were doing communion, and it was the big final night of our camp experience. She asked if she could talk to me. Turns out that she had been abused by an uncle. And he was in prison. He got caught. You know, he had already been taken care of. It wasn't a shocking revelation. People knew. But it was this horrible thing that she went through. She had gone through hell, and it had broken her. And the idea of forgiveness, it was too much for her to handle. She was so incredibly broken. And in her life, she had she'd gotten into drugs. She'd gained a bunch of weight. She dropped out of school. She was suicidal. She hadn't slept in days. Every camp, she, every night at that camp, she hadn't slept. And during the conversation, I was so heartbroken for her. And I asked, I was like, I just, can I put my hand on your shoulder? I just wanted to comfort her. And she said, no, no, no. She could not be physically touched by a man. She was just hands off. And I asked, can I, can I look at you? Can I look in your eyes? I just wanted to make a connection because I didn't know what to do. <sighs> that was too much. She couldn't look in my eyes. She stared at the floor for our entire conversation. And I, I didn't know what to say. And I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. Pastors, some people think pastors, like, we know what to say. We don't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. So I just started talking about the cross start talking about because of what Jesus did, we can leave our broken past at the foot of the cross. And she was so mad that she was mad that her uncle's prison sentence wasn't longer. She's like, he's going to get out in a few years and he deserved to be there forever. 
And I told her, look, no earthly punishment's ever going to be enough because only God's justice is going to be able to satisfy you. And I start talking about how God hates evil and about how he's going to wipe away every tear. And we will have a moment in life. They talk about it in Revelations 21, where he's going to fix this broken world. And I was just, honestly, I was desperate in them. I was just grabbing for pieces that I could remember. And I started talking about repentance. I started talking about how Jesus used strong language, about how we have to die to ourselves and our pain and our past has to die and we need to receive a new life from Jesus. And as I talked, I think it finally started to connect. She finally started to understand what God could do for her in her broken life. Forgiveness was the freedoms from the shackles of her life. And it shows how God can draw out the toxin from the revenge in her heart. He suck it out like a poison from a snake bite and she could actually start to heal. I don't know how long we talked. It was way past all the other campers were in bed. I had other counselors around and at the end of that conversation, she gave me a hug. I'll never forget that moment. <laughs> she was petrified, shaking like a leaf, trying to get her arms around me. And I gave her a very gentle hug. And she said, I haven't been able to hug my father. But I'm gonna go home tomorrow and I'm going to try. And she went back to her cabin that night and she slept. Samson is a story of mistakes. It's not on the, quite the level of my college prank wars, but it's an example of a miserable life ruled by revenge, unable to forgive. And God offers us a better way. And so I want to leave you with this image. I want you to remember the upside down kingdom and how Jesus flips it all around. There is the world's way, there is Samson's way, and then there is God's way. Samson's death was all about suicide and murder. He was there stretched between those pillars after being beaten and mocked and scorned. And with Samson's last words, he wanted revenge on those who would hurt him. He cried out to God for revenge. But there was another man who was stretched out after being beaten and mocked and scorned, there was another man. And with his final words, he cried out to God and said, Father, forgive them. With Jesus' last words, he forgave the men who hurt him. And that's the difference. That's the difference between Jesus and the rest of the world. We all make mistakes. Forgiveness makes all the difference. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we live in this broken world, but you offer healing. Your presence can do incredible things, Lord, and I just ask that you would move powerfully among us. Bring healing into our lives, Lord. We're all broken in different ways, but the answer is the same for all of us. You God, I ask that you enter into our lives, bring healing to places that nothing else can heal. We could try all the other things of the world, all the other methods and different ways to heal ourselves, but it never works without you, Lord. And God, I just ask that you would nudge our heart that much closer to you today, that we would realize how good your example is, that we would follow the way of Christ and not the way of Samson, that our hearts would let go, that we would let go of the fear and the revenge and the anger and the hatred, that we would stop the cycle. Jesus, please help us to break free. We love you so much. In your name, amen. Now, our final song today is a, a really great throwback. And so I want to encourage you to just celebrate with me how great God's faithfulness is. Please stand and join us in our final song.